Hey guys, Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is going to be on biofilms. Could biofilms be preventing you or your SIBO and your leaky gut from healing? It's very possible. We're going to go in, dive into what biofilms are, kind of break you down on this, show you some of the literature and some of the pictures on this so you guys can wrap your head around what this is. And we'll talk about just some natural strategies that we can utilize to be on top of this and to kind of help some of the herbal natural kind of protocols, or if you're going to go even conventional, uh, it's going to help knock down some of the unfavorable microbes in your gut so you can heal and get better. All right, before we do, please smash that like button down below. It really helps with the search algorithm. Put your comments down below on the topic. It really helps like to know what you guys are thinking. All right, so let's dive in. So what is a biofilm? Let me pull up a little little picture image for you guys so you can see or better understand. So biofilms out of the gate, right? They are known as EPS for short, extracellular polymeric substances. So what this is, 90% of it is essentially polysaccharides. That just means sugar, proteins, nucleic acids. And some even say, you know, there's bacteria, there's yeast, there's other types of microbes that are part of this EPS matrix. And you can see right here, here's the different EPSs right here. You can see there's different sanctuaries where a lot of these guys grow, they develop. And think of this as almost like a slime. Um, in other words, like everyone has that, you know, experience of cooking some bacon and then a little bit of bacon grease gets on the counter. If you just use a paper towel to wipe it up, you feel that kind of grease on there. Even after you wipe it, you can feel it. It's kind of slimy. This is what biofilms are. There's kind of like this residual slime. And this little EPS matrix is very resistant to antibiotics. There's some data showing that antibiotics are anywhere between 10 to 100 to even a thousand times less effective when you have biofilms protecting some of these areas. And I even know too, um, my mother who's an orthopedic slash emergency room slash um, operating room nurse from, for I think 40, 50, 50 years now, so a very long time half a century. It's kind of crazy to think about it like that. And she works in a lot of uh, orthopedic surgery cases and they have this, um, the cellophane they actually put over the joint. It's a silver solution. It's a silver cellophane and they wrap the joint and they do that for, because of antibiotic resistance in, in bacteria. And part of what silver is known in the scientific literature is actually to help with biofilms. And so part of the reason why we may have antibiotic resistant bacteria is because of biofilms. And so right here, they use these silver biofilms and wound resistance, right? I mean, this is, you know, it's actually now common in surgical centers to actually use these type of things, which is kind of interesting, right? Because you hear about it, you see it, but then is it actually trickling down into mainstream? And it is, it is, which is really great. So this kind of gives you an idea of what biofilms are look like, how they grow, how they develop. Now, a couple of articles here I wanted to highlight out of the gate. So you can see here, you can have biofilms in the mouth all the way down into the esophagus. There's actually a strong association with H. pylori in biofilms and a strong association even biofilms in the esophagus. I wanted to just show one part here to you guys. I think this is really interesting. One of the nutrients that we'll use, we'll use a nutrient called acetylcysteine, which is a very powerful compound. It's a precursor to glutathione, which is, which is really important. Um, glutathione is a powerful antioxidant. It also helps with lung inflammation uh, and actually helps with pseudocatalase, which is a glutathione-based enzyme for lung inflammation, uh, which is very, very, very helpful. All right, let me just show you here. <clears throat> so right here, Historically, the stomach was thought to be a sterile environment. The discovery of H. pylori colonization dramatically altered the belief. More recently, sensitive molecular techniques have identified the presence of diverse populations, 128 phylotypes of bacteria. So really interesting. Uh, and when you look at this one article, I want to find this one part here. So in significant proportion of the population, the gastric mucosa is colonized by H. pylori. And there was one part in here where they talked about N. acetylcysteine being incredibly helpful. I'll, uh, here it is right here. Recently, a study on biofilm trapping compounds, NAC, has demonstrated the importance of biofilm phenotype in H. pylori. So in this one study right here, H. pylori, they had 40 patients that had failed previous H. pylori therapy. So they actually did antibiotics. They failed. So 100% failure rate. These patients were randomized to receive one week of treatment with NAC or placebo. 13 of the 20 patients, 65% who received the NAC cleared their infection, while only four in the placebo group that got nothing. So that's a huge increase. I mean, that's, 
you know, three and a half X above the placebo. So you always want to compare placebo to it because there's power in the mind. So 10 of those who successfully eradicated their H. pylori infection agreed to, to a follow-up endoscopy. And, and these patients, um, SCM, I look what that means, SCM, I think it may be, uh, show disappeared. It's, I think it's an inflammatory um, condition. Disappeared in all the biofilms and all. While this exciting finding should be confirmed in larger studies, they suggest that the biofilm phenotype plays an important role in human GI infections and provides the first evidence that biofilms dir directed therapy can be successful for GI diseases. So there's actually an H. pylori world will use NAC, will use the pylopass specific. Um, L. ruteri, which is this, the specific strain of L. ruteri that's very helpful at binding and kind of um, almost making it so that H. pylori can't bind. It almost like knocks it and kind of prevents it from being able to bind and dock on. It's almost like an agonist or an antagonist, if you will. It really knocks it down. Saccharomyces can have some beneficial effects on it. So when I look at patients that have chronic gut infections, some people were able to just kind of come in there, make diet changes. Diet's really important because a lot of these microbes have gotten into the state of dysbiosis and imbalance, usually due to poor diets, um, refined processed foods, maybe too much carbohydrate, and then over time too, FODMAPs or fermentable carbohydrates, the, the fructo, the oligo, the disaccharide, the mono, and polyols, these type of carbohydrates that are in even healthy foods like broccoli, uh, onions, garlic, asparagus, sometimes these foods can even feed some of these microbes and push them out of balance. So really important. Um, you have to restrict some of those foods out of the gate. And a lot of times here, there's one article here talking about how um, hydrochloric acid or a low pH is actually very, very important for preventing bacterial overgrowth, which is really important because we always think of like, oh, well, low pH is bad, right? Aesthetic pH is bad. That's how you burn your stomach. But in this article, they're talking about how a nice low pH is actually it prov promotes an antimicrobial environment. Yet we know conventional medicine, if you have any kind of tummy issue whatsoever, for the most part, you can almost guarantee over the counter, they're going to recommend Tums or Prilosec, or they're going to put you on some type of proton pump inhibitor, which we know that's going to raise the pH, right? Because it's going to make the stomach more alkaline. Remember, acidity is one to six, seven is neutral, and then above seven is alkaline. So when you start making that pH more alkaline, guess what happens? You start to invite microbial overgrowth. So it's crazy that a lot of the mainstream just over-the-counter options are actually setting you up for more digestive issues and imbalances. They're definitely going to promote bacterial um, dysbiosis and biofilms as well. And that's going to just throw off and it's also going to affect your body's ability to absorb nutrition, break down amino acids, absorb and ionize minerals. We need good acidity to ionize and absorb our minerals, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium. So very important. Now, starting out a long time ago, I've been doing what I've been doing full time for well over a decade. I always would add in some of the ginger tea, right? I learned about the ginger tea through the GAPS diet, Natasha Campbell McBride, she'd always kind of put ginger tea within the GAPS diet. I thought that was very interesting. And when you study ginger, there's a lot of different things. It's very anti-inflammatory. It's actually an anticoagulant, so it helps blood and everything kind of flow better. When you're inflamed, cells tend to agglutinate and stick together and aggregate. So helps with blood pressure, helps with inflammation. You mix it with Manuka honey. It's very soothing on that gut lining, has a mild antibacterial effect to it as well. And also ginger's an antibiofilm, which is great as well. So I mean, I just showed you the silver, right? And I just want to put this, you know, I'll bring the receipts for you guys. So ginger and biofilms. There's actually a lot of studies on ginger. Reduces biofilm formation of various bacteria, including some gram-positive, staph, aureus as well, gram-negative bacteria like E. coli and pseudomonas. So early on, I always intuitively knew my difficult patients, when I put them on an herbal protocol, various clearing herbs, I always saw the patients that were sicker did better with the ginger tea. I didn't know about the biofilms back then. I just knew that it was soothing. It was anti-inflammatory. It helped things flow better. There was definitely a mild antibacterial effect. It was a natural prokinetic. I knew there was a lot of other benefits that ginger bestowed. And so I always recommend it. I always put it in there because I just saw that it helped. Now, we know more today with all the literature, ginger, very helpful, knocking down biofilms. We also see NAC, love NAC, especially with common upper respiratory type of infections that we see in the environment today. Guess what? NAC is going to help with um, an anti-mucolytic. It's going to help with mucus, breaking down the mucus. It's going to help in improving glutathione levels, which is going to help with oxidative stress in the lungs, in the bronchioles, freeing up that mucus will also help that transfer of oxygen 
from the heart back to the to the lungs, grabs that oxygen, goes back into that left um, atria, back to the left ventricle, and then goes out to the body. So we need that good oxygenation. Um, NAC helps with pseudocatalase, which is an important enzyme for oxidation. There's some, you know, superoxidus mutase tends to also need some glutathione support, and NAC is an important building block for that as well. So we also have turmeric, another good one. Use that, very anti-inflammatory, shown to be helping with blood flow and clotting. Also has some biofilm benefits. We have turmeric slash curcumin. So my line, we use a liposomal curcumin because curcumin is not that well absorbed. You need it in a liposome or you mix it with some black pepper, a pepperine, because it helps improve the absorption. Curcumin by itself is not that well absorbed. So liposomal or a black pepper extract is important. We're going to be adding in the ginger. And you don't have to do all these. Maybe one or two is fine. NAC is wonderful, especially if there's any mucus or any upper respiratory issues or someone also has sinus issues or allergy issues too. It's wonderful. The silver, very good. And then we can also look at enzymes that are systemic enzymes that we take away from food. So not the typical amylase or protease or lipase, you know, fat or protein or carb-based enzymes that we take with food. That's fine, but we're going to take these special ones away from food. And some may even be enterically coated like serapeptidase, lumbrokinase, natokinase. And these enzymes will also break down the biofilms too. So really helpful. Different ways we can knock down those biofilms. Like I showed you in this H. pylori study, which is crazy. It took 44 people that had already not gone through H. pylori treatment well, right? Failed and they did it. And then they had a significant uptake of improvement after they added these biofilms in. So very powerful. So when I work with patients, we're really trying to look at everything holistically. I want to know what kind of bacteria are there. If there's H. pylori, if there's pseudomonas, Klebsiella, you could have fungal overgrowth. You could have parasites too. Sometimes you have to use different herbs and different combinations and also at therapeutic levels to make sure we have enough support to knock it down. And, you know, adding some of those biofilm supports could be helpful as well. And like I mentioned in that paper, right, it talked about one of the low-hanging fruits, right? Just getting someone's pH a little bit lower, getting a little bit of acidity in their digestive tract can actually start to create a little bit of die-off as well. Now, the question is, is that mucosa inflamed enough to receive it? There's a lot of irritation, Barrett's esophagus, gastritis. You got to be careful with that. You got to work with a practitioner to make sure you're dialed in with that. All right. Hope you enjoyed today's video, guys. I'm going to go to questions in a minute. If you did, let me know. Put your comments below. If it family or friends could benefit, feel free and share with them. And if you want to reach out to someone like myself, there'll be a link down below where you can reach out to get functional medicine support worldwide. If you need that, we can dive in, roll up our sleeves and get to the root cause of what's going on. All right, let me dive in here for you. Hey, you're totally welcome. I appreciate your comment. I'll put it up there. All right. And so QD4 Blockchain writes in, which brand of HCL contains animal-based pepsin? It's a great question on that. I'm not sure the actual raw material of that. In my line, we use typically 650 to 700 milligrams of betaine HCL. And then the pepsin, I'm not sure the exact raw material for that, if it's animal-based or not. But pepsin is really good because it's the major proteolytic enzyme in your stomach. Most of the pepsin's in an inactive form. It's in the form of pepsinogen. It's not active. And we need a nice low pH, that nice hydrochloric acid, that nice low pH helps activate and convert that. So taking in some pepsin is helpful. And then also getting that acidity upwards really good as well. Not sure about if it's animal or not. So my line, that's HCL Supreme or Digest Synergy is my lower dose. Some patients can't handle much HCL, so we have a lower dose option too. What do you think of fungal-based pepsin for someone very sensitive to a lot of supplements and foods? Um, so it depends. I would probably just start someone out with hydrochloric acid. I'm sorry, um, apple cider vinegar or even just some lemon juice. Uh, and I would just probably put it in a dropper bottle and just put a couple of drops in water and just drink it with food or even go to some potential bitters and maybe even just start with ginger or chamomile, right? Or gentian. Those are some simple bitters that you can do and start with that. Do it in a tincture form and then just start with a couple of drops, put it in a few ounces of water, drink before a meal and just start with that. Keep it really simple. I always say if you're going to start with one supplement and you're sensitive, start with hydrochloric acid or some kind of bitter, ACV, lemon juice kind of derivative. Good question, though. Dr. J recently did a GI MAP test and an enteroinvasive E. coli came up. Do you have any information on this? Can't find much on YouTube. Yeah, that's typically going to be some kind of a food poisoning based E. coli. These E. coli that's in the commensal bacteria form. And then you have like your classic, you know, 
E. coli that produces either a shigellotoxin or the H1057. I think it's one of the big ones you see like in spinach or, you know, you can, you can kill people because it, you know, it can cause massive diarrhea. And if you don't get water in you or you don't get an IV or some kind of electrolytes, you can have cardiac arrest, right? Um, but yeah, that's usually more of a food poisoning when it can be more severe. I'd be curious if you have symptoms or not, but you'd want to get that looked at, want to get that support, want to get that knocked down. And then, you know, with herbals is, is fine as long as you're stable, work with a practitioner and then usually good probiotics on the backside to really make sure we repopulate or, you know, cause bacillus and la lactobacillus and bifidobacter and acidophilus, all those good lactobacillus bifidobacter species will help crowd out some of that E. coli as well. Uh, which are the best uh, animal-based enzymes. Not sure about animal-based enzymes. The ones I have are plant-based enzymes. Enzyme Synergy is like plant-based. It mainly comes from like papaya, those kind of things. I like it pretty gentle um, as well. And then if I need something else, I'll throw in extra bile, which would be more animal-based. That would be more ox bile. Or we'll throw in uh, enzymes that are more like higher-dose lipase, higher-dose protease if we need more support on top of that. Good question. Does NAC and bringing the acidity up also help with UTIs? Yes. So NAC also does help with UTIs, okay? I bring the receipts. I use it with some of my UTI patients as well. So this is really cool here. Let's do it. NAC's non-toxic antibiofilm agent can prevent cell invasion of IBC. This is a interstitial cystitis, thus providing potential and novel efficacious treatment for UTIs. You can see I clicked on it last week because I have a patient. And they talked about here, conclusion, NAC is a non-toxic antibiofilm agent in vitro can prevent cell invasion. This is, I think IBC is like interstitial cystitis. Where is it? Do they define IBC? I hate when they give me an initial and they don't define it. Uh, some kind of bacterial issue in the urethra. Uh, when combined with an antibiotic, it may disrupt biofilm and eliminate residual bacteria. And then you can also, NAC is also preventative, prevented biofilm formation with E. coli, which is very, very common in UTIs. So that's kind of cool. And you can even do it preventatively, which I think is pretty cool too. I'm sure they even talked about that. I remember reading this article last week. Yeah, so it could even prevent uropathogen E. coli. Just kind of cool in combination. They, they even used it with antibiotics too, but I would use it with like herbs like uva ursi or silver or um, golden seal. I would do it with things like that. Or you can even combine it with D-manos too. The question. What's your opinion about ClO2, chlorine dioxide in fighting biofilms? I think ClO2, I think that's also, is that MMA as well, Miracle Mineral Solution? Um, you know, MMA I think is, I think it's the same thing. Hold on. I'll bring the receipts for you guys. Right, you got a lot of doctors out there that just um, they're just sitting there reading a script, right? They're reading a script. They have no idea what they're talking about. I bring the I bring the receipts for you guys. Chlorine dioxide. Yep, miracle mineral. So that's MMS. This is common in the autism community, right? It's a form of um, a dichloride compound, chlorine dioxide, and it comes in a liquid format right there. And you typically put it in your water and uh, increase it. I've heard in the autism community, it's been very helpful for knocking out bugs, knocking out parasites. I mean. There's a lot of herbs and a lot of things I use, so I don't ever go hard in on just one thing. So put it in your functional medicine tool chest, and if you want to use it, great. In the autism community, you know, dealing with a lot of kids, it's hard to get kids to swallow pills. So I, I can imagine in that community, it'd probably be very helpful because of um, it being easy to take and add it in water. Mm -hmm. And nothing, nothing bad to say about it. Along with the enteroinvasive E. coli, my zonulin came back very high. My symptoms are mostly anxiety, lightheadedness, and bloating. Yeah, MMS. Yep, I figured that. Yeah, so yeah, so you definitely got to get that, the gut looked at, got to get everything addressed fully. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, comments below, share with friends or family. Appreciate it, guys. Have an awesome night. I'm here for y'all if you need help. Take care. Links below. Take care. Bye.